Whether you're on a wild card in game week eight or not, these five players could help you rise up the ranks over the next few weeks. Right then, so let's start with the most obvious, probably knee-jerk pick ahead of game week eight, and that is Ollie Watkins. Now, one thing I would like to say to start off is I actually recommended him last week in my watch list video. So do go back and check some of the points on that. But I don't want anyone accusing me of being knee jerk just because he hauled this week, because I was talking about him before the 23 point haul as well. But with that aside, obviously, he did really well last game week. He's been doing well before that. And the underlying data does suggest that this should continue. I don't think he'll be getting a hat trick and two assists every single week, but with the fixtures ahead and the underlying data to support him, I think Ollie Watkins is a fantastic option. If you're on a wild card, I think it's pretty easy to get to him. But even if you're not, I think there's still a slot in most people's teams for that second striker. And a lot of us are on a Jackson or an Alvarez or a Carlton Morris at the moment. Watkins is probably the pick if you're going to move away from any of them right now. If we look at the underlying data to start with, 0.45 XG per 90 has kind of been going on under the radar until this game week. He's been ticking along quite nicely and until this week he only actually had one goal in the league so far this season. But the underlying data was actually suggesting that he was getting a bit unlucky and even though most of the attacking returns he'd got so far had been assists, his 0.08 assists, expected assists per 90 rather, are actually really, really low. So I think it was a bit of an anomaly in the first few game weeks that he just happened to be picking up the assists rather than actually burying the chances that he'd been given. And it all came good in game week seven. Obviously, he bagged three. He's on four for the season now. And when you combine that with the fact he's already got some assists under his belt, he's now got 10 attacking returns in just seven game weeks. This isn't even his first hat-trick of the season either. He also got a hat-trick in the Europa League about three or four weeks ago as well. So the guy is in red-hot form right now. Now, moving on to the fixtures ahead, it's clear to see why Ollie Watkins isn't just a pick for last game week and we're all being a bit knee-jerk. The fixtures ahead have always looked really good and Aston Villa players from game week eight or nine onwards were always going to be really tempting. Looking at the fixtures now, game week eight, straight up, Wolves away. They did really well against Man City. They're not a bad side whatsoever. But I think as far as fixtures go, Aston Villa should be confident that they'll be scoring away at Molyneux. And I don't think that will be a barrier to bringing in Ollie Watkins this week. Moving beyond that, the hardest fixture of the next five is probably in game week nine against West Ham at home. Now, West Ham actually have a pretty average underlying xgc so that's expected goals conceded per 90 so far this season and it's actually one of the lower ones in the league so far i do expect that to correct itself west ham are a good defense historically and they've had some really tough fixtures but it's still not a fixture i think we should be terribly scared of playing ollie watkins in after that though game week 10 onwards are fantastic fixtures luton Forest away and then Fulham at home is a great run of three fixtures. And I think you're going to want an Aston Villa attacker by that point, no matter what. Arguably, you could wait before getting to game week 10, before moving in an Ollie Watkins or a Moussa Diaby as well. But the fixtures in the next two aren't bad whatsoever. And with other strikers going off the boil a little bit at the moment and fixtures toughening for the likes of Man City, for Julian Alvarez, for instance, Ollie Watkins does look like a really good player to be bringing in ahead of a sea of green fixtures. Even if the next two aren't perfect, you'll have him in situ for 10, 11 and 12. So overall, I think Ollie Watkins is... Probably a bit of a knee-jerk pick for some people, but I think the underlying data and the fixtures ahead support the theory that he should continue to tick over really nicely. Moving into midfield and a player I do quite like the look of as a bit of a differential is Luis Diaz. Now, a lot of people, especially on a wild card right now, will be moving across to Mo Salah, but I think there's an argument to say that you could save the money at an extra 5 million and get in Luis Diaz. The data isn't quite as good as Mo Salah, it is important to know, but an XG per 90 of 0.45 is still really strong. That's still great for a midfielder. And arguably, it should be that little bit higher because he did bury that chance in the 
offside, inverted commas, goal against Tottenham as well. So that would have boosted all of these stats just that little bit as well. And the XA per 90 is also really strong. I always like looking at players that have an XGI, so that's combining the XG and the XA per 90 of over 0.6. If they're getting over 0.6 per 90 overall, they tend to be quite elite players. And Luis Diaz is one of those right now. Combined, it reaches just slightly beyond the 0.6 marker that I would tend to think is fairly elite. Only two goals so far this season, probably should have been three, as we know. So maybe he's going under the radar very slightly because of that. However, a lot of people would be put off the Liverpool player because of rotation. They think that Everyone bar Salah isn't nailed in that starting 11, especially in the front three. But Luis Diaz has actually started every single game but one in the league so far this season. That was against Wolves, where he came on in the second half and got 45 minutes. And in that 45 minutes, Liverpool turned the game around. Remember, they were losing to Wolves at the start of the game. Luis Diaz came on. Obviously, they started playing much better. And maybe that's factored into Klopp's decision making moving forward as well. Another thing to note is that Luis Diaz, Darwin Nunez and Mo Salah are pretty much the only fit players in the front three at the moment for Liverpool that can actually start in game week eight. Obviously, Gakpo went off with an injury. We don't know how bad that is just yet. It might not be too bad. It might not be too long term. But then also Diego Jota got red carded in the Tottenham game as well. So that will be a one game ban, which means that we're pretty certain of the front three in the Brighton game. The Brighton game itself is a really good fixture for attacking returns, I feel. Brighton still haven't kept a clean sheet all year. And as good as Brighton are, as far as we're concerned when it comes to attacking them... I think it's still a fixture we can look at. Beyond that as well, in game week nine onwards, is the real hopping on point for Liverpool assets. You've got Everton at home, Forest at home, so back-to-back -back home games, and then Luton followed by Brentford. Not scared of any of those fixtures whatsoever. And at 7.5 million, he could be a lot easier to get to for some of us who aren't considering wildcarding than at Mo Salah, for instance. The one last thing to note with Luis Diaz that... I think we should take into consideration is the fact that he is an international player. He play he will play in the international break in South America. And quite often Klopp is a little bit hesitant about that next match after the international break. And I think if there are other players coming back in that haven't traveled quite so far, then maybe Luis Diaz is a bit of a question mark straight up in game week nine against Everton after that international break. For all it's worth, I still think he'll start that game. I think he's really important to the way Liverpool are playing so far. And as you can see from the fixtures that we've had so far this season, he's starting much more often than not. So for five million less, is he worth punting on over Mo Salah, save that money and spend it elsewhere? I think for me, I'd still back the confidence I have in Mo Salah, but I really like him as a differential pick and he could certainly tick over very nicely. So the second and final Aston Villa player I'm going to be looking at today is Matty Cash in defence. But when you look at the underlying data, the XG per 90 especially, that's more of what you'd expect a striker to be performing at. 0.42 XG per 90 is absolutely insane for a defender. When you combine that with the underlying XA per 90, which is about what you'd expect for an attacking wing back or full back at 0.12, that is some sensational underlying data for Matty Cash. And when you look not just at the data, but beyond that at the eye test, he is getting forward down that right wing a lot at the moment. He's even played right wing for Villa this season at times. So I really like him as a player. He might seem obvious to some people, but at 23% ownership, that suggests over three quarters of the game still haven't got this guy, despite four price rises as well. He started at 4.5 million. So props to you if you backed him when we were a little bit less sure about him starting consistently. And now he looks like he's pretty much nailed into that Villa defence or even the Villa midfield as well at times when Bailey's out. And he keeps rising in price. He keeps getting those attacking returns. And the data supports the theory that actually he might have even been a little unlucky not to get more goals than he has so far. Two goals and one assist so far this season is great. Three attacking returns for a defender after seven game weeks is fantastic. Let nobody fool you on that. And 34 points so far as well. One of the leading scorers for defenders. 
And again, like I mentioned with Ollie Watkins, the fixtures to come suggest not only attacking returns are on the horizon, but also potentially clean sheets. So we could be looking at some bigger hauls for Matty Cash over the next five game weeks. Wolves don't score a ton of goals. West Ham will be a trickier fixture. So I think let's park that one aside, even though it is green on the fixture ticker. And then beyond that, the next three, Luton, Forest and Fulham are all really good opportunities, not just for attacking returns, but none of those striking forces are incredibly potent. So we might also get the clean sheets there. And any defender that gets an attacking return and a clean sheet in one game week is very likely to get maximum bonus as well. So as far as that defence is concerned, Matty Cash seems like the ideal entry point to the Villa defence. And I think attacking returns are still going to come. The worries I used to have at the start of the season were that he might not be nailed but he keeps starting matches. And at some point, you've just got to say, maybe this guy is safe for minutes going forward. And I know I'll definitely be having him on my wild card this game week. And I think even if you're not on a wild card and you don't have him yet, this is a great entry point. 4.9 million is still easily cheap enough. It's still easily value. And the fixtures ahead suggest points are. Now, Pedro Neto is an interesting player that has kind of been on the edge of making my watch list for the last couple of game weeks. But I think it's finally time to have a look at him properly and discuss him. At 5.6 million, he probably isn't a player that you're going to prioritise getting into your side unless you're looking to downgrade a spot in midfield and free up some money for another premium like Mo Salah or maybe a Hyunmin Son, for example. But 5.6 million for this sort of underlying data is something that's actually quite hard to ignore. Wolves aren't a side that historically score a lot of goals, but this season they look like they might be a little bit more attacking. I don't think they're going to start scoring bags and bags of goals, but Neto seems to be that, that talismanic figure. He's getting 90 minutes every single week at the moment, which is something that can't be said for a lot of other options around this price point. And the underlying data suggests that the returns should probably continue fairly consistently. 0.18 XG per 90 isn't the highest of midfielders, but again, let's bake that into the fact that he's 5.6 million. He is cheap. We don't expect a goal every week from this guy. But the XA per 90 is elite. 0.31 XA per 90 is fantastic. And the five assists this season show that it's not just the underlying data. He's also performing on that underlying data at the moment. And despite the fact that I don't think Wolves have got a load of strikers that are going to bury the chances that he creates. I think they've still got plenty enough about them for some people to be hitting hitting the back of the net off of his chances every now and then. And again, I keep mentioning it, but 5.6 million, you don't expect massive hauls every single week from these players. You just expect them to keep ticking along nicely. And some of the fixtures ahead are very playable for someone like Pedro Neto. Aston Villa at home, okay, on paper, it's a, an orange fixture, it's a middling fixture, but Villa haven't been keeping a lot of clean sheets so far this season. And despite what I said about Matty Cash, you might have a bit of a flutter at Pedro Neto if you think that clean sheet's going to go. He's probably more likely than most other Wolves players to be the one to actually take out that clean sheet for Aston Villa. And then beyond that, Bournemouth away from home in game week nine is a great fixture. You can probably ignore game week 10. If you can bench him, then great. But he has already got an attacking return against Man City, for instance. So maybe let's not be too scared of playing even the better defences. And then Sheffield United away in game week 11 is certainly a fixture to target as well. So I, I wouldn't prioritise this player above any other more attacking options in midfield, maybe a human saw on a James Madison this week. But if you're looking for a player, if you're on a wild card and you're struggling with budget and you need that fifth midfielder that's going to play each week and get decent attacking data, then Pedro Neto could be the guy. And even if you're not on a wild card, if you want to make that double switch in midfield or you want to move value elsewhere, then downgrading one of your midfielders to Pedro Neto, you're still going to get a few attacking returns out of him. He's actually a relative differential at 5% ownership as well. And then you can move money elsewhere without having to wildcard as well. So I think overall, Pedro Neto is a guy that a lot of people will probably ignore just because he plays for a team that you don't expect a lot of goals from. But the data suggests that this should continue and there are some fixtures in the next five to actually back a Pedro Neto in. 
So I don't mind it as a pick whatsoever. And with Anthony Gordon banned for this game week, if you're on a wild card and you don't want to bury Gordon on your bench, Pedro Neto could be the ideal replacement. So last up this week is another Tottenham fullback that maybe we haven't looked at so much this season because of his counterpart, a doggy on the other wing. But Pedro Porro has been ticking along really nicely. And actually, despite the fact that he's a little bit more money, he's a player that's coming into a lot of people's thoughts. Again, especially on a wild card, but even if you're not on a wild card, at 5 million, he's still pretty accessible. And with the fixtures to come, he's a player that you can definitely jump on now and expect attacking returns and clean sheets from in the next five. So to start with, let's take a look at the fixtures and then we'll do a bit of a direct comparison with a doggy. Luton away in game week eight is a fantastic starting point. Obviously, Luton could score at home, but I still think that they're an attack that you can't really expect to be scoring every single week. So Tottenham have a fair chance of a clean sheet in that game. And obviously attacking returns seem fairly likely for a lot of Spurs players in that game. After that, Fulham at home in game week nine might be a low block. So Pedro Porro will have a license to get further forward as well. So I expect him to be trying to create the chances from in and around the edge of the box. After that is Crystal Palace away from home. Crystal Palace don't score a lot of goals anyway. And Eze is out for around six weeks. So he probably won't be playing in that in that game. And he's their main attacking threat at the moment. Everything sort of runs through him. So any team that's playing Crystal Palace at the moment, I would have an extra little look at because it looks less likely that Palace are going to be potent moving forwards. Chelsea at home in game week 11, not ideal. Chelsea actually look fairly good at the moment. Two back-to-back -back wins, one in the cup, one obviously in the league. And Chelsea do look like a team that are on the rise. But I still don't think that's a terrible fixture. And then after that, Wolves away. Obviously, we've discussed Wolves a lot already in this watch list. It's not a terrible fixture by any means. So Pedro Porro, I think he's got the fixtures to be backing, especially if you're on a wild card. But why should we be spending an extra 0 0.2 on Porro over the likes of a doggy? Well, to put it simply, I've got a doggy in my side. I've had him since game week one. So I've got value tied up in him. So I probably won't be looking at a Pedro Porro. But if you don't have value tied up in a doggy and you didn't get him at 4.5 or 4.6 nearer the start of the season then Poro becomes a lot more interesting because when you look at the underlying data, so XG per 90 of 0 0.07, that's far higher than a doggy who's getting 0 0.02. So he's more of a goal threat than a doggy. So that's a great starting point. He's like almost four times more likely to score a goal than a doggy is in any given game week. It's still fairly minor, but it is better. And then when you look at the XA per 90 as well as at 0.13, that is also slightly higher than a doggy as well. So a doggy's, for example, is 0.11. So again, he's up on both of the underlying metrics. On the eye as well, he seems to be the player that's used as that overlapping run more often than a doggy is. A doggy seems to be cutting inside more often and getting involved in the link-up play, whereas Poro, to my eye anyway, seems to be the one that's getting down that right wing and being used as an outlet to get that cross in. So he'll overlap the right winger, so Kulisevsky, for example, and Kulisevsky will drop inside and Poro will get round the right and get the cross in. So I think actually Poro in the next few weeks, especially against some low blocks, and I expect Luton and Fulham to be doing that, I think Poro could actually benefit from those sort of sides that they're playing in the next two weeks. So overall, I think if I was to summarise, a doggy, if you've already got him, the underlying data and the price is good enough that you probably just hold. And if you've got value tied up in him, I don't think it's a switch to Poro. But if you don't have a doggy yet, or if you don't have value tied up in him and you're on a wild card, then Poro is probably the better option at just 0 0.2 more. And I think he'll stay relatively low owned because of the ownership of a doggy. And that could also really benefit you if you're able to get to a Pedro Poro this game week. So yeah. I think Poro is a great option. I don't think he'll get too many buys this week because of a doggy. But if you've got that 0.2 million spare, you could get the extra benefit from that better data than a doggy has. So let me know what you think between a doggy and Poro in the comments below. I'd be really interested to see which one you're going for for the weeks ahead. 
So that's all from me today. So hopefully you enjoyed the five players that I'm taking a look at ahead of game week eight. Now it is also important to note that I'm on a wild card this week. So if you want to see my final wildcard team selection, then do tune in around this time tomorrow because I'll be posting what is a fairly locked in wildcard selection. There might be little edge picks that move in, but overall, I think I'm almost set up on a wildcard quite nicely now. If you enjoyed today's video, then please do remember to leave a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future content like I mentioned. But in the meantime, good luck ahead of game week eight and I'll see you hopefully tomorrow for my wildcard team selection.